I want, I got to ask this one question real quick. So did this game, did you guys playing against, against each other in this game 50 years ago, get it, it seems like this is a beautiful relationship. Did, did this kind of start from that moment forward? Did y'all keep in touch after that? Or, or when did this bond really kind of form? Len and I, I believe, are roughly the same age. We're both high school class of 70 right. and, you see, and college class of 74. Correct. An era when it took four years to graduate from college. And, and you can so, only play three years on varsity. So. Yes. So I'm going to say that we're that relatively the same age. I'm 71. But I'm also going to say that we grew up in, in different cultures in different uh, basketball universes. And I'll let Len describe his first, and then I'll set the record straight at the end. Well, you know, we grew up uh, differently, no question about it. I went to a school that was trying to, you know, make a name for itself, trying to find a place on the map. And, you know, we had a, uh, we had a, a terrific coach, but a showman in Lefty Drizel, who uh, more than anything was a terrific promoter. And, uh, you know, had to speak the words UCLA of the East. Uh, I think when we signed uh, my senior year in high school that with the resources Maryland had and, you know, the access to players on the East Coast, they saw what UCLA had done, the dominance over the years before Bill with, you know, my, uh, my fellow high school alum, Lou Alcindor, now Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, and even before that, to, to win national championships, and Lefty wanted a piece of it, and it, that was, uh, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, I, I guess the um, the promotional pitch was that UCLA of the East was meeting the real UCLA. So you talk about our relationship. You know, it began without us knowing each other, but in my case, it was uh, a question of awe uh, watching Bill his junior year, particularly in the uh, championship game against Memphis State, uh, where he was so dominant. I don't think there's ever been a more dominant performance in a, in a college uh, basketball um, NCAA tournament game. And believe it or not, Bill, I don't know if you knew this, I watched that tape all summer because I knew we were playing you guys. And I had to memorize, in my mind, everything that you did. And so, you know, when uh, high noon came, when we played you guys, I thought I was ready. But, you know, our relationship began then. We actually spent some time off the court. I don't know if you remember. Um, I went to, I think it was your apartment or your house. Uh, saw a nice Italian bike. I know you were a big bike lover, uh, bicyclist, uh, aficionado. And um, I was, again, in awe. Uh, but when we got on the floor, I guess I couldn't be in awe any longer. Yes, but you you had some very good teammates. And while Lefty was the promoter, and he did what he could to build this Maryland team in, into a real power, you know, when you had Tom McMillan, when you had John Lucas, two guys who I've also grown close with over the years. And, but John Wooden was completely different from Lefty Drizel. John Wooden was not about promotion certainly not about self-promotion, sure. and he was not about hype. John Wooden epitomized the conquest of substance over hype. And with John Wooden, it's easiest to start talking uh, about him with the things that he did not do or that he was not. He never spoke about winning and losing, and he rarely talked about basketball. We never watched film. He never used the blackboard. We never had a play. He rarely called timeout. We desperately needed some, but he refused to do it. He felt that timeouts were admissions of defeat. And then he, he in four years with John Wooden, he mentioned the other team. Your team, Maryland, was not one of them. But he mentioned the other team twice. We lost both of those games. Thanks a lot, Coach. And then uh, he, he he never started practice with these words. So what do you guys want to do today? But we had uh, a superb team. We had uh, great, great players. And this, but the game in early December at Pauley Pavilion, which UCLA uh, trounced the Terrapins by one point, 
Uh, and this was a portent of the doom that was on the horizon because uh, there had been some problems in the off season uh, with John Wooden and the key to our team, Greg Lee. And the chemistry on our once dominant team was no longer there. And Greg's role on the team uh, changed dramatically. And so in a game that had Jamal Wilkes, Dave Myers, Marcus Johnson, Richard Washington, and me as our front line for our guard, Tommy Curtis, to take 17 shots in that game. It was just absolutely ludicrous. It was the antithesis of what we were all about. But as, as we went through, we were most fortunate to win that game. And then we won a whole bunch more. And then... It, in early January, January 17th, 1974, not that I remember the date, but I uh, broke my spine and everything changed for me. Everything changed for our team. It was a game against a, a Maryland guy who had tremendous ties because, you know, I have so many relationships with the people from the University of Maryland. You know, George Raveling, who was the first black coach in the ACC, George Raveling, who became the first black coach in the Pac-12. And then, uh, you know, he was the coach of Washington State. And it was a, a situation where uh, I broke my back and, and everything changed. And then we ultimately lost to Notre Dame. And then we lost a couple of conference games late. And then we lost to, to David Thompson, who was uh, admittedly a, a great player. But, you know, one of the lessons in life that John Wooden uh, always said was, whatever you do, uh, just... Make sure that you've done your best and that you don't beat yourself, you don't cheat yourself, you don't shortchange yourself because that's the worst kind of defeat you'll ever suffer. And that was kind of uh, that was kind of the same thing Lefty would tell us. Uh, but listening to you speak, it's amazing how many intersections we have. You know, George is the one who recruited me in Maryland, right? And uh, you named his son. His son's middle name is after me. We became very very close. Um, you know, the the losses to David Thompson, we know a little bit about that. We lost to them three times uh, by no more than four points. The last one was the determinant of who was going to the NCAA tournament. Uh, we were number three in the country. You guys were number two. They were number one. We lost to them in overtime. We had to go home. We couldn't play in the tournament. Um, and they played the every game the in North Carolina. The by the NCAA. As, as, yeah, it was. They expanded the year after. They did not have their business act together at, at all. And so it, it was, you know, tragic what, what happened with, you know, and, and that happened at so many different levels. And thank yeah. goodness David Stern came along and, and got everybody together and whipped, they whipped things into shape and, and, and made basketball what it is today. But John, John, you want to hear about this game, I'm sure. <laughs> Well, let me ask you, Yo, because do you remember anything? I mean, all of, this has all been great. And, and, you know, you mentioned Tommy Curtis earlier, and he talked about how tough this game was. And, Bill, I think that y'all had played Arkansas the night before. Lynn, for Maryland, you had come off two really good seasons beforehand, and you've, you're you basically opening the year with a top-five matchup. So, first for Lynn, what, what did this game mean for kind of like the momentum of Maryland? And then for Bill, what did playing a, a game like a top five game mean in terms of starting the season, so to speak? Well, for us, as I said, you know, UCLA coming off a national championship against Memphis State, um, you know, dominant performance, particularly by Bill. You know, they, they put a lot of pressure on me since I was the guy who was supposed to guard him. Um, you, did fine, it, Lynn. you did fine. You did fine. Thanks. I, I, I shot 32% from the floor in the game. So Well, I mean, look, it, what you want. And you had also, I remember you had 27 rebounds. You played that one-man zone and never left uh, the paint. My job was to try to pull you out. Um, you never came out. I mean, I, I shot 9 of 18, which was a lot of shots for me, considering Lucas and, and McMillan on my team. Right. But, but nevertheless uh, – you know, it, it was it was an exciting game. And the thing that we had done all summer, as I said, I did watch film. I watched tape. And, um, you know, I, I tried to get all your moves down to the point where I can anticipate. But, 
you know, it still came down to, you know, our other guys. Uh, I think Dave Myers did a terrific defensive job, although it was in front of uh, Booker Turner. Uh, <laughs> that one play where Dave hand-checked John Lucas out of bounds in the last seconds. I think in the last two minutes of the game, we outscored you guys nine zip to get back in it and had possession, uh, the last possession. And Dave kind of hand-checked John Lucas. Lucas stepped on the line, or did he? But Booker Turner, didn't he, wasn't his nickname Booker Bruin? I, it I don't wasn't, know. Okay, it was, let's set the record straight. It was not Booker Turner. I although, thought it was his call. Although we never lost a game with Booker Turner as a referee at Poly Pavilion. But Are you I sure call, it wasn't I, him? I can also say that we never lost a game in my four years at Poly Pavilion. But the referees were Ernie Filiberti and Irv Brown. And we okay, never so it was Herb Brown. And somebody we, said that because I didn't know any of the Pac-10, Pac-12 refs at the time. But in the end, it, you know the the play. And I thought Lefty made a mistake in the huddle. He called the play for Tom. I was the one that was knocking down shots. I think you you intimidated Tom a little bit, blocked a couple of his shots. Uh, but again, it was uh, one of those games where you guys. We were back and forth. You guys took a bit of a lead, and we came back uh, down the stretch. But it was all about us playing for, you know, to playing for the ability to belong. You know, you guys were, you guys were royalty, and we were upstarts. And you know, we tried to find ourselves in a position where we could say we could compete. It set the tone for us because after that, I think we won double-digit consecutive non-conference games before the ACC. So in some ways, it helped us a lot. Uh, but, you know, it, it left a taste that I still haven't forgotten. So, you know, we're both on the cover of Sports Illustrated, although you were on a few more times. Um, but it got me on that cover. And, you know, we, uh, you know, to this day, I guess you chalk it up to posterity. But it, it's a game that I thought we could have won, especially at Pauley. We only lost two games at Cole Fieldhouse during my career so I wish we had played you guys in Cole. And what an incredible home court that was at Cole because you know that historical relevance of that building you know to have the 1966 final four there where Texas Western you know had the great, yep. great victory there and then also the 1970 final four where Sidney Ricks and UCLA took down you know the, the mighty artist Gilmore. In yeah I was there. Yeah. That's when I that's when I signed. Lefty knew <laughs> that the college basketball world, uh, the media world, would be congregating in College Park for the Final Four, and so he had us sign do our signing there, and had every newspaper in America uh, just about covering college basketball also present. Right with and with John Wooden, you know he he never he he didn't treat any of the games any differently whether it yeah. was the championship game or whether it was the first game. You know, his his basic pregame speech was this. I've done my job. The rest is up to you. When the game starts, don't ever look over here at the sideline because there's nothing I can do to help you. And I had never seen Maryland play when we played you guys in December of 73. And uh, I didn't have a television as far as I knew, your games were not on TV where we yeah. I did not have a telephone. I got my news from the newspaper and from the radio. And and then also from Greg Lee, who, who had an encyclopedic mind. And he would see something, hear something, read something, do something, and he could recreate it. And it was just absolutely brilliant. And you know, I was very shy, very quiet, uh, much the way I am today. I couldn't speak at all because of my lifelong speech impediment. I was an avid reader and I loved my bicycle and I loved going to UCLA. And it was just very special because the fans, which, you know, every game that I played in, in, in four years of college basketball, including the freshman year, every game I played in, it, it was completely sold out. You couldn't get a ticket. And yeah. I, all of our games were on television, but I, I can't say that about the other schools. Our games were on national TV at a time when, you know, there weren't a lot of games on national television, but our games were on too early. You were probably out biking or in class somewhere, you know, East Coast, West or Coast time differential. 
in church or in the library, which is where I spend most. Okay. Time. <laughs> but I, I I have you know the simple twist of fate that brings us together here today. You know I I love to read, and I just uh, I I read one book this summer of, a lot about Maryland, and then I'm reading a current book about the, the Washington D.C. Maryland area as well, and. Uh, the first book that I read this summer was uh, Prophet of Freedom, a biography of Frederick Douglass by David Blight, who's a history professor at Yale. And I had read an article in the newspaper that David Blight had published about this book that he wrote a few years ago. I bought it a few years back. It's just an 800-page monster behemoth, you know, of a book. And it was sitting there, sitting there. And so this summer I said, I'm going to read this book. And I had no idea that I was going to be calling Maryland. And it it, it starts, you know, it starts with his life uh, in Maryland. And it's just an incredible book, as important and powerful a book as I've ever read. And then it, it covers every aspect of, of the history of Frederick Douglass' remarkable life. And then just recently, a great friend of mine recommended a book by one of the people in my life who went to University of Maryland, although he did not graduate, Carl Bernstein, the reporter from the yeah. Washington now, but it was the Washington Star in the early days. And so he has this relatively new book called Chasing History that is staggering in its brilliance, in its storytelling, in its recreation of life and all the events that you and I as contemporaries now in our early 70s uh, lived throughout our entire life in, in, in a, a remarkably changing world. And the way that he's been able to tell that story and, and bring me, draw me right into this area and an era that you grew up in, that you lived in. And uh, you know, I know you went to Power Memorial. Uh, yeah. You know, all knew that about you. Uh, but you didn't play Helix when you were uh, in high school. And uh, I, you, you would have had trouble. We had a good team there at Helix. Sure. It was hey, a, so, you so both I, mentioned. So I had this. I, I had this great culture that I grew up in as a child, uh, a child that, that whose parents had zero interest in sports. Zero. I, I never shot a basket with my dad. We didn't have a TV growing up, and never watched sports. Never talked about sports. My mom was our town's librarian, but I grew up in this culture that was created by John Wooden and Chick Hearn, the greatest broadcaster ever, who was the Laker broadcaster, who just made everything sound so fantastically fun and exciting and dynamic. And then here was John Wooden, who was the personification of excellence and, 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 and the search for perfection. And, and, and that was my life growing up. And then yeah. I... And then I, uh, you know, I got to go to UCLA and I got to know Chick Hearn and, and listen to watch, uh, listen to and read about all those games. You know, he broadcast for 40 plus years and, you know, and I, we never missed it because it was just so much fun. And, and that joy, that excitement, which uh, I got to be a part of, I mean, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. And then to play with Greg Lee, with Jamal Wilkes, with Dave Myers and Marcus Johnson and then Henry Bibby and Swen Nader and Larry Hollyfield and Larry Farmer. These are guys who graduated before our game in December of 1973. And right. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. And yeah, a, lot of, a lot of great talent. A lot of no great talent. Me. Guys I played against in the pros right. and played with. Marcus Johnson and I were teammates. Right. But, John, you want to go forward with this game? Uh, I, don't know. I was going to say you both touched on something. Oh, hold on one talking. second. Hold on before I forget this. Because you know, John wouldn't, you know, you, you talked about watching the films, you talked about uh, Lefty being the promoter and trying to recreate the UCLA of the East and everything. John Wooden was nothing like that. Oh, I know. He he felt that the other team was just irrelevant cannon fodder, and 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 should, you should just ignore them and just play your game, and everything would be fine. And most of the time, it was. Yeah. And, so you both you both touched on something about television in there, and I believe this game was nationally televised, correct? Yes. So I have, I have no idea. All our games were on TV, right? But I, I, if I remember right, I think it was an NBC like national tele televised game. So did that lend any like extra juice to the game as when you're going into it, when you're thinking about it or playing? Well, for me, not really, because we had played on national television 
several times. Matter of fact, we played probably at that time on the the most watched college basketball game in history, which was on a Super Bowl Sunday. We played NC State. Yeah. Um, you know, it was I, a home game. I, and I, I, I'm going to challenge, challenge, challenge that team. statement, Lynn, because uh, yeah? UCLA, Houston, and the Astrodome. No, I said, yeah, maybe, but a, a regular season, how's that? That was right. Mean, and it was, okay, and possibly uh, one of the most. But that that game was on Super Bowl Sunday. We were right before the Super Bowl which was, I think, Miami and uh, Miami Dolphins and uh, the Washington team uh, at that time. So it was, uh, you know, it was a spectacle. But we were we were used to it. And you guys, obviously, you're on TV all the time. Um, and, you know, it didn't, nothing seemed to phase your team. Uh, you talk about all the, the things, guys what, one of the who things, were stars. One of the things that was excellent about John Wood is that he taught you to – think like a champion, act like a champion, play like a champion, and to become the champion. And, and we were expected to do all of those from the first day we got there. And so, you know, uh, winning was something that we just assumed was the natural progression of life. And, and, and no question that you guys absorb that extremely well, but you also can't deny the fact that you look at the talent on that team, on on all of those teams over that three year period, not just you, but the the, the accompanying uh, accessory players that you know were unbelievable. As I said, some of those guys I played with are the pros, and um, you know you just marvel at the talent. But the combination of philosophy, combination of execution, efficiency, all those things, you know, you guys were the standard, and that's why Lefty used you as you know. Um, uh, you know what what could be uh, essentially that's what that's what he wanted to see and he didn't say we're going to be like UCLA or as good as UCLA he just thought in the east we had all of the all of the ingredients now the question was who wanted to come and be a part of it well that was coach wooden's recruiting pitch to me and i assumed to the rest of the guys first of all jamal wilkes I couldn't speak at all. Jamal was so quiet. And so, you know, Greg was the guy who could talk. And Greg was the best. Yeah, yeah. We were all academic All-Americans on the team. And, and and so, but John Wooden's recruiting pitch as he was putting the team together through Denny Crum, because Coach Wooden, he did not like the, the recruiting aspect. You know, Coach Wooden was the first great player in the history of basketball, went on to become as great a coach as there ever was. Sure. And so, you know, his recruiting pitch to me was, Bill, you're at the fork in the road. You got to make a choice. You got to make a decision. And everybody else is promising you everything in the world. But the only thing I can promise you, I'll give you a chance to be a part of something special. And being a part of something special is a privilege, a privilege you have to earn every single day. And then he said, but if you want to be the champion, I've seen you play, Bill, you're going to be fine. But if you want to be the champion in everything you do, it's not how good you are. You're fine. It's how good the guys next to you are. And that's what I'll promise you. I'll promise you that I'll get the best players to be with you. And 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 because those are the guys who are going to determine the ultimate level of achievement, accomplishment, happiness, and success in life. And so to have Greg Lee and Jamal Wilkes, who came in as the core of the of, of, of that team, and then to have the guys who were already there, Henry Bibby, Larry Farmer, Larry Hollyfield, Swen Nader, Andy Hill, and then the additions that he made over the years, with particularly, there was a lot of them, but Dave Myers, Marcus Johnson. Johnson. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. I now I was I would say this. You know, you talked about Denny Crum. I, I got a call from uh Gary Cunningham. So uh -huh. I don't know when, where that put me on the echelon. But I had to tell them that um I, I couldn't consider UCLA because I followed that guy once to Power Memorial. I wasn't gonna follow him again. And and certainly we might have played together, but I, I couldn't make that trip and I couldn't follow him because there was no comparison. I wanted to follow Kareem. Yeah, well, I, I, I did Kareem. once. No, I, <laughs> hey, I had learned from my earliest coach, uh, learned to love pressure 
and learn to love and, and want and, and demand that responsibility and the, and the accountability on your own shoulders for making sure that uh, the job got done. Um, I, I would want to jump in and um, we're getting close to our time here. So I, I, I have one thing that I want to do with each of you. Before you say that, I want to know if Maryland's going to bring me some ice cream. I mean, I, I, I can't believe that you guys got a dairy on your college campus here. I will see if we can freeze dry it. Maybe you can put huh? have a new hey. ice cream flavor. Next time you're over. Ice cream flavor, and you didn't bro. work. Len, Len, did you work on the farm when you were there? I mean, come on. No, I didn't work on the farm. I'm a city guy. I, a city I did guy. a little I did a little construction. I ran a uh a, 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 a what is it, the campus canteen for a little bit, but I I never had a chance to go and mess with the cows. <laughs> Uh, no. All right. So I'm going to say I, I found two quotes from each of you after this game. And I'm going to say the quote or, or the statement, and then I want your reaction. So, Lynn, you blocked one of Bill's shots. And then apparently he turned around and looked at you and said, nice goaltend. Yeah. See, he says he, he says he didn't talk much, but he said that very clearly. <laughs> All right. And then, Bill, I have no memory of that. <laughs> Lynn called you the baddest dude anywhere. I'm not sure if, if baddest is uh, is a positive or a negative term. Come on, man. I'm from New York City, and back in the day, you know what bad meant. <laughs> bad was good. <laughs> I'm the luckiest guy anywhere. I got to I got to play at UCLA. I, I got to play for John Wooden. I got to play with all my teammates and it, it was just spectacular what we had. And it's just so sad that uh, the outside influences and choices and decisions uh, came in and, and, and ruined our senior year, which, which should have been our best because we had the most talent that year. But yeah. chemistry often trumps talent. And, and then you have to have your health, which I had lost with a broken spine. Let me show well, as far as I was going to say, John, as far as that, that uh, comment by Bill, you know, that it was goal 10, you know, it, it kind of set the stage. Uh, but in the end, as I said, they found a way to win. And, and that's why I had to give give the props. It was a pleasure and honor and privilege to play against Len Elmore at every level. College. That, that was when I fouled him. I blocked the first shot or first or second shot, and then he got me up in the air. Well, I can't believe you went for that head fake. I, I couldn't make a shot in the game. I was eight for 23 from the floor. Oh, my gosh. Well, what I mean. It, what would it like to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated for you both? Well, for me, it was, you know, extraordinary honor, particularly to be on, you know, with Bill in that game. I just wish we were on the winning end. But I suspect that Bill was on there enough that it was probably all hat for him. I, I was on the cover 19 times. See, <laughs> <laughs> is that a record? No, no. It, uh, when it was happening, I was near the top. I was never at the top. But then, uh, since then, a, a lot has changed. Were you ever on the cover of the swimsuit issue? Uh, no. <laughs> All right, real quick. Last Thank goodness. Second. It, any other thoughts just going into this weekend or just thinking about kind of UCLA and, and Maryland basketball? I love the history of Maryland basketball. You know, I, I, what Lefty did, you know, and, and, and then to have Gary Williams, who was superb. Because Gary Williams, he was the coach at, at Boston College when I was on the Celtics and Len was there at, at, at Harvard. And so uh, – Len, I don't think, was playing anymore at that time. But, you know, we would play in those days that, we, you know, we always scrambled. I was playing law school intramural basketball. Right. Did you win the championship? Yeah, actually, the city. We played uh, Cambridge City. And uh, I didn't play long enough. I had studies, so I couldn't play in the playoffs. When I went to Stanford and, when, and I could no longer play basketball at all, this was before the Celtics in the early 80s and had all the foot troubles, I went to Stanford Law School to start a new life and a new career. While I was there, I had a pioneering experimental surgery. I was the first guy I'd ever worked on. I started to play a little bit. And I played on the Stanford Law School intramural basketball team. And we won the championship. 
uh, for the first time in school history. But to see to see what all these guys, you know, Gary Williams, great relationship long term with him and uh, what, what he did. And he took the, the, the Terrapins to the uh, Final Four in 2001 before winning it in 2002. In 2001, though, one of our children played in that Final Four, Final Four that had Michigan State, Arizona, uh, Duke and, and Maryland. And so here it was. But then, you know, Tom McMillan, the relationship that, that we had. Uh, although it was uh, marred because uh, I was playing for the Celtics and he was on the uh, the Washington team. I don't know what they were called at the time. Uh, bullets, probably. Anyway, w w the Celtic team was rolling. And I came in for my stint off the bench and, and, and they immediately sent Tom in there to go after me and he splattered my nose. And, uh, and and I couldn't finish the game. I couldn't because it wouldn't stop bleeding. And I had to spend an extra couple of days in the hotel in Washington because I couldn't fly. I, could, I couldn't get out of bed because it was bleeding so bad. And then John Lucas, what a tremendous uh, life story that has been, what he's been able to do. Then Buck Williams, one of my favorite players, uh, and, and what he was able to do for the Portland Trailblazers. And then Walt Williams, uh, how he helped uh, dramatically and resurrect the, the school's fortunes in basketball. Uh, after what happened with Len Bias. And I, I, I had never seen Len Bias play, but I, I met Len Bias because the day that Len Bias was, or the day before Len Bias died, Red Auerbach brought Len to practice uh, at the Boston Garden and introduced him all to around all the guys. And he seemed like just a really fine fellow. And, and everybody who I've ever spoken to had nothing but the finest things to say about Len Bias and what he was able to do on the basketball court. And it, it's just tragic what happened to him in his life. Let me just finish this, John, by saying that I don't know what's going to happen this week. Last year, obviously, UCLA literally dismembered Maryland basketball I watched that, uh, on the court. But, um, you know, the history of both of these schools, there, there's some – there are a lot of reasons to be proud, uh, to be a proud Terrapin, but certainly to be a proud uh, Bruin. The only thing I can say is that many times I wonder, you know, when I said I didn't want to follow Lou Alcindor or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as I did at Power Memorial because there was no comparison. I, sometimes in the back of my mind, I wonder, what if? Uh, so, you know, that that's the only thing that I can say whenever I see UCLA play. Uh, but, you know, I also say, what if? If, um, you know, we made one more shot, did one more thing. It wasn't that last play. It was probably something in that game that could have tipped it the other way. But being what it was, we came up short by a, a point. But yet still, you know, in our minds, we can still say that uh, we were able to compete with the absolute best and, um, you know, came that close. So. But, Bill, it was a pleasure. Good seeing you again, as always. Uh, you know how great you know. Maryland is? You know how great the Terrapins are? The Grateful Dead wrote a song about the Terrapins. Uh-oh. Terrapin, I can't get enough. Terrapin, I can't figure it out. Terrapin, is it the end or the beginning? Terrapin, here we go. It's going to be a fantastic game on Friday night. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I get to sit there in Len Elmore's seat and broadcast it. I wish you could join us, sir. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm here in uh, now sunny Florida on vacation. Uh, you know, I teach at Columbia University, and I know you. Do. You know, we'll start we'll start next semester. Um, so I'm getting prepared for for the semester upcoming. But I'll be watching the television. No question about it. Are you doing the game? I am doing the game. Oh, great. Okay. I'm the luckiest. Well, I'll be definitely looking forward to listening to it and listening to some dead stories and anything else you can come up with. Well, we'll try to we'll try to bring it all there and it'll just be fantastic. <laughs> and you know, the the I watched that game last year, UCLA and Maryland, and I could not figure out what was what was happening. But they have a very promising young coach in Kevin Willard. And I'm looking forward to that. UCLA has got an all-new team, all their stars from the recent past. Uh, they've all moved on to new careers, new lives. And uh, this is a team that's finding its way. And as soon as yeah. they, 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 they you have to make a shot, you have to guard somebody, and you have to get a rebound, then uh, then they've got a real chance. Well, Mick will, Mick will kick them in the gear. I, Mick McCrone and I go way, way back. So 
If you oh, tell uh, us that you, story, tell us that you, story. When you talk about, no, Mick, Mick, when he was assistant for um, Bob Huggins, um, and yeah. then when he went on to coach his own teams, um, you know, we always had a chance to visit. And he came back to Cincinnati. We spent some time together. Um, you know, just a, a fun guy, uh, committed to basketball. You know, I was really surprised he left the city of Cincinnati, his hometown, because I thought he'd be there forever. But um, he's done some wonderful things uh, for for UCLA. He's going to be a fixture there. And, you know, this, this team right now, they may be learning uh, over the next year or two. You know, I expect them to to be contenders. So, you know, I don't expect anything less uh, from Mick Cronin. And the similarities of Kevin Willard and Mick Cronin, both whose dads were legendary. Yes. And, you know, little short guys, fiery, feisty, scrappy, getting it done out there. Former point guards. That yeah, and then make to run the show. The point guard that you played with, John Lucas, that guy was very special. You know, I was, I was there – in a lot of John's uh, games, highs and lows uh, in the NBA. And uh, I'm so proud of John that he's, you know, got things going again in a positive direction. I am too. So he's a close friend. Because that guy was, uh, he was really, really great. And, uh, number one thank overall draft pick, John Lucas. <laughs> yeah, he, he, and he deserved it. John, thank you for uh, setting this thank up. You. This is great. You guys have been great. I man. love Len Elmore. <laughs> I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Thanks for letting us win that game, Lynn. No, please, Bill. Come on, man. If it was in my power, you know, you wouldn't have done that. That's for sure. It wasn't. In I know power. that. We yes. we needed we needed it more than you did. That's no, sure. we we needed every one of them. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for spending the time. I know you both have a lot on your plate, so I appreciate it greatly. And we're uh, still processing out what we're going to do with this but this has been an awesome conversation i look forward to sharing your thoughts with folks and and bill i look forward to seeing you in a, another couple of days yeah, yeah. Send pictures of the farm send pictures of the cows and the dairies and all that kind of stuff I'll bring, them, bring them some ice cream you guys on the charter you could probably put it in dry ice bring them bring them some of that that uh ice cream I love, the dairy. I love and, and and by the way, you talked about your father. You never played ball with him. I didn't either. That that's what I played with. My dad played catch. Baseball was my first sport. So and those really? are my Yankees and does Jackie Robinson scoring, but that's grist for another mill. Guys, take care. All right. Thank Fantastic, you both. Man. Thanks, you, Bill. Uh, you're a great champion, Len Elmer.